everybody's still with us here. So uh, EWI works with uh, uh, people who manufacture stuff. We develop manufacturing technologies, and some of those people we work with are part of the supply chain for the nuclear industry. They provide uh, components and systems. Um, and they're in a really tough business environment. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, where's, uh, here we go. So, you know, about five years ago, looking ahead, you could see uh, that coal was going to be under a lot of pressure, there were going to be a lot of plants closing, and there was a sense that there might be a nuclear renaissance, and we ought to be developing new manufacturing technologies, new fabrication technologies, and implementing them in the, in the nuclear space. And there were a lot of plants that were planned, and there was a lot of excitement, and then Fukushima happened, and that took the wind out of everybody's sails. Uh, around the world, things are kind of mixed. Um, yes, China and India are c continuing to charge ahead, but a lot of other countries are having second thoughts. Um, if that wasn't bad enough, um, look at the, the cost of natural gas. Um, so those of you who have uh, been around a while like me may remember when we were talking about $2 gas at the wellhead and everybody should be using natural gas, and uh, then the price went up to $14. And it's since come back down with the discovery of ways to, to uh, exploit the shale formations around the world. Um, and it's been pretty low and it's also had an impact. Um, I don't know if you remember an article recently in the Wall Street Journal uh, talking about how perfectly good nuclear plants were being retired. Why? Because there was so much cheap natural gas out there, we're going to replace them with gas turbines. Um, so the EIA still predicts that we're going to see a lot of nuclear power in 2040. But honestly, that's not going to happen if uh, we continue to use short-term thinking. Um, so here's one of the issues with that, is what happens if the price of nuclear gas increases again? Which, it's a very volatile product, no pun, well, pun intended. Um, and so, uh, well, look, look at how, what a big component of the price of power from a gas uh, facility, the price of fuel is. And so you're going to see a lot of pain if everybody suddenly starts going off to, to natural gas and abandoning nuclear power. Um, we've had some successes over the past uh, uh, 10, 20 years in uh, upgrading plants, and that's maintained the share of power uh, by nuclear. Um, and as plants age, we're going to need new technologies to maintain this level of performance. Um, the challenges still remain. Uh, you've got uh, concerns about uh, is the grid capable of continuing in this uh, large central station uh, delivery of power mode or do we have to have more distributed power? That doesn't typically bode well for nuclear. And then waste issues never been addressed. So um, basically as a, in a summary, the industry is really being held back by a number of challenges. Chronic cost overruns, delays in manufacturing, the high cost of a typical plant, uh, it can be a bet the company uh, decision. If you look today, this morning, the market cap of AEP, not a small utility, was $21 billion. They're looking at investing 5 to $10 billion in a new plant without the certainty of return. Uh, that's a tough bet. Um, trend away from large central station generation, as I mentioned, uh, competition from natural gas, renewables, and uh, still no credible uh, solution for waste. Well, it's really important that we address this as Ohioans because there are a lot of companies that would benefit greatly. We have a lot of material suppliers, we have a lot of component suppliers, sensor manufacturers, power plant designers. Um, last time I checked, Ohio was number three in the nation in terms of number of companies that have end stamps to supply uh, product into this, uh, into this market. So it's really, it's important that we understand what the opportunities are and seize them and get on with it. And there are some opportunities. You heard about some things today. Some of them are very far out. Some of them are a lot closer in. So the one, the one that I think is closest in is the small modular reactor. You heard about Empower as an example. Um, you get economies of mass production because you're producing it in a plant. You have a more stable workforce. You maintain quality, um, uh, consistency. The, possibility of going in smaller increments, you can do distributed power, it's less of a risk. Um, and as I say, Ohio is well positioned because we've got one of the, uh, one of the leading contenders in this state. Um, another possible opportunity, high productivity construction technologies, uh, things like high deposition rate welding processes didn't exist when we, when we were building plants before. They, they are, there are many variations available today. 
uh, more rapid and accurate NDD technologies. Um, again, those didn't exist uh, back in the day. Uh, they do now. Um, there are different materials or different cladding technologies, so there are possibilities ahead. Um, life extension is another one, pathway to 80 years. Uh, we've, we've already extended to 60 years for many plants. There's going to be a lot of technical issues uh, going further, um, you know, in terms of uh, new inspection technologies, new repair technologies. The thing that I think is most interesting in the near term is this th with thorium reactors. Could solve the waste problem, uh, could significant, significantly reduce the cost. Um, there hasn't been much government investment. I think there needs to be more if we could uh, uh, develop a, a design and license it and do a demo. I think a successful demo will attract industry investment. Industry is really good at managing commercial risk, but this isn't a commercial risk proposition today. It's a technical risk. Government's role is to invest in buying down technical risk. So, um, I think you're going to hear some more in, in, from the next speaker about this subject, but this is, I think, something that's really critically important that, uh, for, the, uh, for our government to focus on. Um, that's it very quickly. Any questions from anybody? Uh, any questions for Dr. Cialoni? Um, I had one question mm -hmm. that I ran into um, when I was working. <laughs> And that is with the decline in uh, nuclear power and, and uh, refurbishments and building and so forth. Um, the number of uh, qualified vendors uh, and people who have the capabilities to do the kind of uh, welding, for example, that you've mentioned, and have the quality assurance programs have, has gone down to about a third of what it was in the late 70s. And even those people have great difficulty maintaining their quality assurance programs. Do you yeah. have any thoughts on that? Well, I agree with you completely. In fact, I think the number is even lower than that. I think it's more like a quarter. Like back in the 80s, there was something like 900 companies that, that had the end stamp certifications and, and all that. And now there's maybe 200. Um, and it's, I mean, how, if you're running a business and you're having to make payroll every month, how do you make that investment? A significant investment, not only the, the cost of going through the process, but the preparation for for that and the main, maintaining of your, your certifications. How do you justify that if you don't see a business opportunity out there? So people have held on because they, they kept on hoping and they continue to hope, but but they're they're reduced they're reducing a number and, and some of them you know, may have just basic qualifications but not not have maintained all of them. It's it's difficult. Yes. Related to that question, could you address how large the whole manufacturing support side is from an economic standpoint? You mentioned it's down about 200 certified companies. Uh, what's uh, do you have any idea around the top line what that represents economically? Because obviously, as that grows, yeah. then the, the impacts up. Right, right. I don't don't know the answer to that question, but you know, if you think about what what does energy in general represent in the economy, it's about eight percent. But that's not the real issue. The real issue is the whole economy is driven by, the, by a, an assumption of low cost, abundant energy. And so if we, if we don't have that, and I, I would submit that, that uh, nuclear power is one of the solutions to that. Uh, if you don't have that, then uh, the whole economy suffers. So it's not just the jobs that are directly involved, it's all the knock-on effects. Do you, do you have, uh, we've got a number of different companies represented here that are in Ohio. Um, how can we uh, encourage development of these companies that support the nuclear industry, or is that the tail wagging the dog? Yeah, I think that that will follow if, uh, if the industry uh, takes off. So I think um, I mean, one of the challenges, I don't know how you overcome short-term thinking, and that's what's going on right now in large measure, is people are looking at very low-cost natural gas, not even thinking about the fact that it's throwing more carbon into the atmosphere. Um, you know, just jumping on the bandwagon of I'm going to reduce my cost today and, and somebody else will worry about tomorrow. I don't know how you affect that. So there's policy, there's technology, those are things that can be worked on. Mindset is a bigger challenge. Yeah, I think once we have the ability to export um, liquid natural gas, right. uh, you're going to see the price skyrocket because of world demand. I think so, and um, like I say, you know, these, this is this is a product that's, that's volatile both physically and, and economically, and it doesn't take a big disparity between supply and demand for the price to suddenly take off. Yeah, man. Hey.
Um, I have a two-part question. Okay. First of all, I want you to expand a little bit about the cost for business for being involved in the nuclear industry and the, the cost of certifying to, to be nuclear, and how long would that take if, if companies de let those go and then how much it takes to, to recertify. And then also the burden of regulations in the nuclear industry versus in the other industries that you're involved with. Yeah. And why is it, is it, is it as a supplier to that industry, does that particularly affect your business and your decisions to stay involved in that industry? Yeah, it's a couple of really good questions or two sides of a very good question. So uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly what it costs. I think it's something on the order of a quarter of a million dollars to the end stamp and it may be you know, six to 18 month process. If you imagine though that you know, people are, are dropping their certifications because they don't perceive an opportunity. Suddenly, let's just say there's an opportunity out there. Let's say you know, that the need for medical isotopes is uh, what triggers uh, the, uh, the move of the government to invest in a demo of the thorium reactor and from there, all of a sudden, we see the economic you know, light bulb come on and people are, are starting to, to produce this, right? Um, well, it's not just going to be one company going in for a renewal or one company going in to, to re recertify. It's going to be a bunch of them. So now you're going to have a log jam in the process because there aren't a lot of people out there who are reviewing these proposals. So, um, you know, I think it'll just, it, it will be uh, very unpredictable and very, very nonlinear. Um, what was the other part of the question? About the burdens. The burdens, yeah. So, you know, when we, we work with, with people in all kinds of industries. So, you know, automotive, aerospace, oil and gas. So we're contributing to the problem, I suppose, a little bit. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, most of those industries, I mean, they all have regulations. They all have constraints that they have to live with. But they're not quite as, as severe as the guys in the nuclear space. So they come up with a better way of doing something. I, I would say the, the, the one area where it's most similar is medical. But any other industry I've seen, if you can come up with a more efficient way of producing a product that meets a performance spec, just do it. Okay? You don't have to get that process certified, you're meeting a performance spec. Medical, you have to, go, you have to get the, the, the process certified as, as you do in nuclear. So you come up with much higher productivity uh, fabrication technology, you then have to go through a whole process of getting that accepted. Um, which was what we were starting to do with the, with the supply chain five years ago, but then, you know, that, that lost momentum because of the, both the emotional reaction of, of Fukushima, I guess you could characterize the emotional reaction, or the reaction to low-cost gas as emotional, emotional as well, as well as financial. So. Yes, sir. Um, so, I guess, continuing on the topic of the tail wagging the dog, yeah. um, in the U.S. there are uh, some nuclear power plants that are currently under construction for right. units. Um, right. And there are many that are planned in the pipeline, but most of the growth in the nuclear industry, as far as power plants goes, will be in China, India, and other Correct. countries, right? Um, so as a nuclear supplier uh, in Ohio, what is your perspective on the growth of, of the supply chain in Ohio or the nuclear industry in the U.S. as a supplier for the world market? Well, you know, that's a really good question. A lot of those countries have uh, a lot of rules that stand in the way of doing that. Uh, they want their own industry to be able to produce the parts and components. Um, they'll, there are, let's not name names, but there are certain countries out there that will have you go through a process of proving that your product is worthy to the extent that they get all the information they need to produce the part themselves and then guess what, you're out of luck. There is an excuse for why you can't be a supplier. So um, it, it's, I don't see the opportunity, you know, th there should be a great opportunity but there are barriers in the way. Right? So, and most of the countries that are, that are jumping into uh, nuclear are, uh, do tend to erect those barriers. 